Good afternoon, everybody, and a huge welcome to this, this seventh in our series of um, events in partnership with UK Construction Week, focusing on cultural change within the built environment. Um, this, this event, Strategy Eats Culture for Breakfast, is looking at cultural change um, in construction built environment from the LGBTQ plus perspective. We've got a fantastic panel joining us. And as always, I'm just thrilled to be here. So my name is Rebecca Lovelace. I'm the founder and chief dot joiner at Building People. I'll provide a quick introduction to Building People and, and what it is we're doing and how um, we are working to support um, all communities, all diverse audiences to access careers and other opportunities within the built environment. So a huge welcome. And let's kick off with just a plea that this isn't just about us, this is about all of us. So please help push this message out. If you are active on social media, I've listed all the various building people handles and usernames. And we're really, really keen that you participate in this session. So on my screen over here, I look at the uh, UK Construction Week platform, and that's where I can see what's being um, what's going on in the chat. And I can also see the questions that are coming in. So please do join in, uh, do share your observations, your thoughts, your stories, your challenges, your ideas, put them in the chat and um, I'll be feeding them back into the panel discussion as we progress throughout the session. Uh, we are also crowdfunding. The whole point of building people is we create one place that makes it easier for everybody to find all the diversity and inclusion initiatives that are taking place. And we can't do this on our own. So we are crowdfunding this week to take building people from our prototype, which focuses on surveying, to every trade, to every profession across the built environment. So really, really keen that you play a part in that. A little bit about building people. This was the slide that uh, we created back in 2017. Arguably, it could have been created in um, potentially 1917. But the, what the point, for, um, point of the slide is just to say that it's not joined up. Please don't take it literally. It is um, just a visual to show that there is a huge amount taking place in terms of the um, organizations that work with diverse audiences, the, um, the people, the businesses that are trying to find people and, and make their businesses more innovative because there's a range of individuals working um, part of the workforce. So it's not joined up. It means it's inefficient, costly, and it's not effective. So the rationale behind building people is, why don't we just join the dots between what is going on? So I'll just very quickly show you our, our website. And the website is a very simple um, visual at the beginning, which we call our six button approach. And what we have within building people is just an aggregator. So we have brought together about 300 organizations that you can find through the search organizations module. And these are organizations that work with diverse audiences. So they are the ones that will help people find work experience, help them find jobs or training, help them with bursaries, maybe with childcare or maybe finding a mentor. And, and we've made it easier to find these organizations. We've also made it easier to find information that relates to diversity and inclusion, skills and careers, and also to social value. And this information we've created in partnership with Designing Buildings Wiki. Because, and, and I will say this until, until I'm blue in the face, we are not duplicating effort. All we're doing is simply bring together what already exists. And when we realized that Designing Buildings Wiki is doing that, we didn't have a focus on people, we said, well, let's create that together. So search organizations and find information are both pan industry across the built environment. The other four modules are specific to surveying, which is our prototype. So you can find somebody to ask some help to share their experience and knowledge. You can find out what courses are available, what events are going on, look at job opportunities from work experience to placements, apprenticeships, jobs, and find resources specific to your needs. Now, the whole point of this is that it's not about building people, but we've created tech that can be replicated. So any one of these providers that has this reach into diverse audiences can use this technology so that those individuals can have a more seamless user journey to find the information they're looking for because it all sits in one play in one place so we underpin we enable we add value we don't compete and we certainly do collaborate so just to almost finish off one thing we've done is we've brought together directories of diverse businesses so this is um, examples black professionals in construction 
has a, a supply chain portal of BAME owned businesses. So let's send people their way. Stopcox today, they launched, in fact, at our event earlier on, they launched the National Register of Tradeswomen for Tradeswomen to register. The whole thing will go live, I believe, early next year. And this is a fantastic place. You can, you know, you can find tradeswomen easily. So we in Building People have helped people um, find these fantastic organizations doing this work. And the last bit I wanted to show you is, this is what underpins us. This is what enables building people. So these are the organizations that work with diverse underrepresented groups. So they are the people that our industry needs. And we've broken down these um, groups into six communities, uh, not, not because that's um, the way we want things to be, but because mostly the, the groups have a focus on a particular area. So if we look, for example, we had the, the women's community earlier on, and um, we have um, many organizations that have come together and are sharing best practice, working together, to actually uh, do more, do more, you know, more collaboratively. And the focus today is on the LGBTQ plus community. Um, and these are just some examples of some of the organizations that we're working with um, more joining the call we have today. So just to end off, I'd just like to reiterate, please, please do join in, um, use the Q&A, use the chat to engage. I'm now going to introduce our fantastic panel chair. So I shall stop sharing my screen. Um, and Misa, if you'd like to, turn your camera on. Um, Misa von Tunzelman, a huge welcome to you. Misa is going to be chairing the session. Misa is the marketing director at BNP Paribas Real Estate, and she's also a board member at Freehold. And also I'm, I'm really honored and proud she's a board member at Building People and has brought a whole perspective of a, a very um, different world to me, um, being in my unique Building People perspective. So Misa, a massive welcome. Um, I will put myself on mute and um, Keep an eye on the chat and I'll leave you to introduce the rest of the panel uh, for a fantastic discussion debate. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Rebecca. And um, hello, everyone. Um, if I can ask Tina, Chris and David to uh, switch on their computer, uh, their, their videos and their um, audio, um, we will we will kick off. Um, so I think we've got uh, just under an hour um, with you all at um, this virtual construction week to talk a little bit about what's going on within the LGBT community and property um, and how we can change the culture for the better. Um, before we do that, I just um, wanted to introduce the panel and, and hopefully ask each of them to take a couple of minutes to tell us a little bit about who they are, what they do and where they come from, um, and perhaps maybe why this topic is important to you. Um, we have got a fabulous panel here. Um, so we've got Tina Valentine, who is a sole trader. Uh, she runs Tina Valentine Property Services, and I think is one of very few women working in this field. So really delighted that you've been able to join us today, Tina. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've got David Mann, um, who is a chartered building surveyor. Um, he's a partner at TFT, and he is also the co-founder of Freehold and, and the chair of the board of Freehold. So um, really great to have you, David. And last but not least, Chris, um, who is um, a board member of Planning Out um, and who is also um, involved with Planning Comms and VR. And he's on my other page here. Sorry about that, Chris. Um, <laughs> but a, a fantastic and well-studded panel. Um, I wonder if I could just ask you all briefly to give us a couple of minutes on who you are, where you come from, and why this topic's important to you. So, um, Tina, maybe we'll come to you first. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Tina Valentine, and um, I'm a multi-skilled tradeswoman with over 30 years of experience working all over London, working in the most like prestigious of properties to doing charity work for people. Um, I'm multi-trade, so I pretty much do all trades apart from gas and major electrics, um, and that's so I can refurbish a whole house by myself. I've been doing it for 30 odd years and yeah now I just want to try and get more people especially the diverse audiences into the trades and uh yeah and I represent the, the, the gay community I'm yeah I'm gay <laughs> you probably have guessed that already <laughs> thank you that, that's um that's fabulous and I have to say I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll have loads of questions for for you and from other panelists and from the audience but I I would be delighted at some point to hear a bit more about how you got into that 30 years ago because that's a that was it's a tough gig now let alone then I would imagine so, yeah it's harder definitely yeah, yeah thank thank you Tina. um David could, could you tell us a bit about yourself 
Sure, thank you, uh, Misa. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, I, I suppose I should admit that I'm a white middle-aged man, which um, seems to be a particularly <laughs> unpopular um, uh, genre to be at the moment. And thank God I am gay, otherwise I wouldn't appear on any panels at all, I think. Um, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm a charter building surveyor, partner at, at TFT, uh, specialising in uh, technical due diligence and, and project monitoring for funds. Um, about, uh, no, well, uh, just over nine years ago, uh, by happy accident, bumping into uh, my co-founder on Clapham High Street, Salim, um, we started Freehold, uh, really just out of a frustration that uh, we were both gay in um, in real estate, him, him as a lawyer, me as a surveyor, um, and there was no visible role models, networks. Um, in fact, uh, we suspected or thought the entire industry was fundamentally um, homophobic. And so when we started Freehold, we honestly weren't sure whether I was going to get struck off the RICS or what was the kind of reaction we got. Unfortunately, uh, we got a great reaction from the industry and they were really, um, they had an appetite for change. Um, fast forward nine years, we've got 1300 members. Um, we have a very active mentoring scheme. Um, before COVID, uh, a very healthy networking um, program, which is now largely online. Um, and, um, uh, and we still have much to do, but we are sort of engaged by most uh, of the big firms and institutions. Brilliant. Thank you, David. That's great. And uh, last but not least, Chris. Hi there. So I'm Chris. Um, I'm the uh, co-founder and co-chair of Planning Out, um, which has been going for four or five years now. And um, we set it up, um, Simon Brooksbank and I and, and Johanna Weber, uh, mainly because we were all working together and we had no idea, a bit like David and Celine, that each other were gay. We weren't openly out to each other and to our colleagues and our clients. And we just thought, this is crazy. Um, you know, we need a platform where we're talking to each other and we're encouraging each other and we're sharing best practice and we're giving each other business. Um, so why don't we set something up um, for people in the planning industry and in the built environment to come together and network and and kind of really be themselves and be out um, and encourage other people in our, in our sector to do the same. Um, so in four years, we started with about 30 people at our very first event. And um, now we've got something like 800 plus on our mailing list. So there's a real appetite out there um, for LGBT you know, employees and professionals in the boat environment to come together and, um, and network. Fantastic, thank you. I mean, all, all three of you are real trailblazers and, and I think what you've done, you know, and the, the things that you've just talked about here, I think have created already real change in the industry as a LGBT person in the industry myself. I know I've, I've felt the benefit of that. Um, it, it, it kind of leads me to my first question really, which is, you know, Rebecca was talking earlier about the need for change, but we've seen quite a lot change for the LGBT community. Networks and parades and rainbow lace. Do you think do you think the job's done around LGBT inclusion in our industry or, or is there is there any anything more that should be done around that? I don't know. If maybe David, do you want to have a go at that one? Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Um, I, I, th I think We've jumped leaps and bounds uh, in, in, in recent years, um, particularly in the professions. Um, I think we've got a lot more to do in construction, if, I, if I'm honest. Um, I, I very rarely see anything really visible on building sites um, supporting any forms of inclusiveness, let alone LGBT. Um, and I just, I'd be really interested actually, if there's anyone watching today, whether they've um, seen anything or, or, or seen any initiatives by um, by the big contractors, which particularly stand out other than, you know, wearing the rainbow laces, uh, which was a Stonewall initiative, um, which has really made LGBT people feel welcome within the construction industry. I'd, um, I'd like to see organisations like the Considerate Contra uh, Constructors Scheme um, perhaps do more um, and even construction line, which is used by a lot of my clients to pre-qualify contractors. Um, it, it, you know, you can, you can be skeptical and say it's, it's just a policy tick, -boxing, uh, tick, tick uh, box ticking exercise. Um, but um, if it's going to impact on contractors actually being awarded contracts, 
and then and how they perform on those contracts, uh, winning the points for the under the CCS, um, I think that would probably have a more positive reaction by by them as soon as they can see it potentially hitting their bottom line. Yeah, picking up on that, David, I think I think there's a real hunger to kind of meet and collaborate with other LGBT employees in the built environment. Um, so from my role in planning out, too many people at networking events tell me, you know, they're not out at work um, because they're hedging their bets, you know, they're, they're trying to um, decrease the chance of being on the, the receiving end of any underlying homophobia in that, in that business or company um, that could potentially damage their career prospects. Um, and it's really worrying how many people say, they use the term fear of losing respect. Um, the idea that your colleagues are going to judge you if you come out gay in, in the workplace, um, you know, in this kind of this use of discriminatory language. Um, so there's one guy at a networking event who was telling me that, um, you know, they were talking about two separate gay colleagues who were having lunch. And he said, oh, I like those guys because um, they're not in my face about the gay thing. And um, it just comes up so often, um, that kind of language. So it, it makes people kind of hide um, within themselves. So I think, you know, the more things like freehold and planning out and more events that we do, I think there's a real hunger to come to those events and, and share your stories and kind of work out how we can tackle this together. Mm. Um, I'm sure we'll come up with some ideas on, on this platform today. Yeah. Yeah. Do, do you think that there's a there's a difference geographically or, or in terms of certain sort of elements of the industry um, that, that have moved faster or slower or, or is it more is it more random than that? Um, I think in London, I, th I mean, London's always going to be a, a kind of a trailblazer, I suppose, because the concentration of, of LGBT professionals in London. Um, but we've had loads of companies approaching us from Manchester and Birmingham and as far as Edinburgh, um, saying we're really keen to learn how to set up a similar thing to planning out. Mm. David, I'm sure that Freehold has said the same thing. Mm. Yeah, we've, we've um, uh, uh, you know, we, we are a group of volunteers uh, in London um, and we'd love to do more regionally, but there are some great U uh, regional groups like um, uh, Open Land in, in Birmingham's. Um, yep. which follows the same model as, as, uh, as Freehold is doing, you know, really, really good work in Birmingham, but, um, and, uh, and Manchester as, as well, I've got a group. But, um, you know, Scott, uh, there's still not enough being done in Scotland. And I have uh, Scottish colleagues at the RICS to say, you know, when are you going to, when's Freehold going to come up to Scotland and give us a group that we can have? Um, you know, we need to, there's someone on the call in Scotland who wants to volunteer. Uh, we'd love to help, uh, help you set up. I think I think that's one area actually where in a way lockdown has been quite helpful in that we've all got more used to engaging like this so I think it does help us a little bit to break down those barriers and it's not the same as face-to-face -face contact but it's it, it you know it does does help I think allow some people who otherwise wouldn't have access to a conversation like this to join in. Um, Tina, I'm conscious you've probably spent quite a lot of time in your over your last 30 years in a um, on a building site of one sort or another. I was I was thinking, you know, listening to this, if I was a potential apprentice or grad LGBT, I might be thinking, oh, you know, is this the right choice for me? What what sort of advice would you give someone that's listening to this, thinking about a career in construction? Yeah, it's a funny one because obviously listening to. Um, Chris and David, you're both men, so you turn up as a man, and the, the hidden thing about you is you're gay. I turn up as a woman in the construction industry, and yeah. already there's the sexism I've got to get through, first of all. So when I come yeah. out as a lesbian, that's the, the least of my problems, actually. <laughs> yeah, ironically. Um, so I think being a woman in trades has been far more difficult than being a gay person in trades or a gay woman in trades. Yeah. So I think for any... Um, I'll say gay plus because I'm dyslexic. When I say LGBTQ and all of them, I sometimes get them around the wrong way. So I'll just say gay plus. So anybody on that you know, continuum, um, I think coming into the trades is actually a really, really, really good career choice. And especially as a um, sole trader, as a self-employed person, because I've bypassed all that discrimination. And I can say from the customer's point of view, they absolutely love having a woman and a lesbian do their job. So yeah, I think the more diverse and inclusive and all inclusion is great for the industry and for the customers. Do you have any networking events, Tina, that you're part of, like female women networking events for people in your trade? 
Um, on Facebook, there's women on the yep. tour, and it's a fairly new Facebook group. There's 1,600 yep. plus tradeswomen on there. So I'm, I speak to a lot of women on there, do quite a lot of networking. Also, yeah. Scott Cox that um, Misa mentioned, Hattie and Mika that run that, I know them very well. Um, yep. So yeah, I do do a lot of networking, trying to encourage more women and more diversity into the industry. So when I say women, for me, I've already included BAME, people with disabilities, the gay plus community, youngsters, ex-offenders. So sometimes people have misunderstood me when I've said, I want to try and help more women into the industry, that they yep. thought I was talking about white, females, educated. Um, but I'm not, I'm, I'm talking about all inclusion. I'm just more women because there's not enough of us in, in trades and in the construction industry generally. I don't know about you, David, but I really struggle to encourage more women to come to evening networking events. Um, so planning out, we started doing breakfasts because we found that women want to take part in kind of early morning events um, more than the, the kind of the later evening events. Um, and that's been a really good forum to encourage more women, LGBT, BAME women, um, to kind of come and talk about their industry and, you know, and share some tips. Yeah, it's it's frustrating. It's frustrating. We we get accused of being um, uh, undiverse as a as a diversity group, but um, you know, sadly, we uh, we reflect the industry that we represent, and we, we you know we're always encouraging more women and, and BAME uh, people to, to to join Freehold. But but you're right. I mean, um, they it, it's still walking into a room full of uh, boring men in suits, really. So we we do have a separate. Uh, women's events and we encourage um, people to bring their partners as well which often makes um, walking into a room a, a bit easier and I, uh, I you know I've done lesbian ping pong and I had uh, apart from being beaten probably uh, I'm, uh, I'm allowed to be an honorary lesbian and very proud to be one. <laughs> I have to say I was there you were pretty good at the ping pong much better than I would have been. <laughs> I, I think it's, I mean, it's an interesting point, isn't it? Because I think a lot of our industry is set up in a, in a certain way. And I think in terms of how we network and how we, how we work together, you know, everything from jokes on a building site through to, you know, how a contract is, is delivered was built around a certain, you know, fairly stereotypical, you know, male way of working. And it, it's interesting as we're sort of evolving that people are finding different ways to do that whether it's a breakfast or an online seminar or you know or, or what so that it's it is a more inclusive um experience um tina just so before we move off the point of our hopeful uh lots of people in the audience that want to come into construction um you you were talking just before we went on on air around a, a kind of goal that you've got about bringing apprentices into your um into your business but some of the sort of challenges around that i wondered if you wanted to sort of talk a little bit about that yes as a sole trader the biggest challenge I've got is to take on apprentices because of the cost involved that I have physically put down my own tools to pick up like to help train people and pay them their wages which I can't afford to do but luckily the government have just started um, a new scheme called kickstarter where employers can take on minimum 30 youngsters that are now stuck on universal credit and may face long-term unemployment so so long as I can take on 30 of them the government will pay them 25 hours a week um, minimum wage so it's not fantastic but at least I won't be paying them and then I can train them in, in various trades but I have to drum up 30 jobs so how I'm going to do that is to contact landlords who want their houses done fairly quickly before the tenants move in and actually train them in empty houses that need refurbishing so yeah. rather than trying to set up or send them to college actually have a real house where they get absolute direct hands-on training. And by the time they've done one house, they'll be ready to go out and work basically. And at that point I'll set up my own company. The ones that want to stay can work within the company. And then I will pay them out of the money that comes in from the business. And the yeah. government Kickstarter lasts for six months. So I've got yeah. six months to train them and get them ready to get out and earn some money. So yeah, yeah it sounds very exciting. That sounds really <laughs> exciting. I'm, I'm hoping there might be some potential apprentices out there, LGBT or otherwise, that, that might take you up on that one. So that, that sounds like a really good way of getting around a, a, a difficult, a fairly sort of, you know, a formulaic way of working um, as a sole trader. So that, that sounds brilliant. Thank you. Yes. Out oh, of interest here, do you work with housing associations and, and local councils? Yet. Not okay. yet. These are all the things I struggle with because I'm a sole trader. All the things that you guys do and Rebecca keeps talking about, joining all these things together. I don't know how to do that because I'm a trader. I think I could help you link into some, some potential local authorities. I would love that kind of thing. 
that would be brilliant yeah. because I need the houses and I need the youngsters and I want yeah. all youngsters all diverse youngsters like we've said before from the gay community the BAME the you know people with the criminal records I want all of them yeah, <laughs> yeah. fantastic this is it's happening it's happening here this is uh, LGBT plus networking do, doing it doing its bit I can see Rebecca's giving us a little uh, a little hurrah sign uh, if there's anyone watching um that wants to 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 come in with a question or a point please do feel free but um uh, as we're um, as we're going ahead i um i have one more question around um allies which i think is a a, a a sort of well well used term within the lgbt plus community about the importance of allies and I've, I've certainly in my own career um been lucky enough to have some some really supportive people around me um that have made it much easier for me to come out and be out um at work than it otherwise would have been um from from your perspective, you know what what do you think it takes to be an ally? Um, I'm thinking particularly in the construction side of the business, um, and and why why does it matter to have allies? Um, and have you you know do you think that you can be an ally for other people? Can you can you tell us a bit about a bit about that? She said, looking, um, Chris, you got your you got your speaker on, so I'm I'm going to suggest you're ready to roll on that one. Um, yeah, I think I think having straight allies is, is really, really important. I think they lend credibility and I think they help um, unlock resources and kind of buy in internally. Um, my, my point about allies, and this is from my experience at, at, in my company, there's kind of a danger when you're looking um, to leadership that you find, you know, your most senior, most openly gay um, person and say, oh, because you're openly gay, you know, you can be the, the champion for LGBT issues. Um, and I think sometimes we have to think that actually the best person to be, those, be that champion isn't the openly gay senior manager. Um, it's probably, you know, one of the, the straight um, people who is very open-minded and progressive and willing to step in and, and champion a good cause. Um, because otherwise I think it's just a, a real imposition to say to someone who happens to be our, you could be our, our gay champion. Um, but I think, you know, that involvement of straight allies just, it really, it really helps a company progress and, and makes, a most transformative effect on the whole culture um, of the organization and that's to, to the benefit of gay and straight people. Mm, oh, fantastic. So Tina from from your perspective on site is that um, you know have you have you had that experience of, of allies in, in as a sole trader? It's the funny one because to me somebody who's not an ally is somebody that is either sexist or homophobic. So I would just like people to not be any of those horrible negative things. And then you're automatically an ally because I'd like us to all be allies to each other. You know, whether you're a straight person supporting the gay community, but even within the gay community, mm -hmm. maybe you're the bisexual person. Well, I'm an ally to the bisexual people because sometimes they're not included. So I think Thank just you. be an ally, just be nice. Just yeah. be nice to everybody. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. build, on the building site sometimes, I have had the sexism way more than I've had the homophobia. And it's mm. been horrible. And yeah. that's what's driven me to always be self-employed. I've sometimes gone back on a building site and yeah, the sexism is the worst thing. So I can imagine mm. if you're probably a gay man on a building site, it would be horrendous. As a lesbian, I've kind of gone under the radar, I think. Mm. 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 I, I have the best disguise ever. I don't look at all gay, you see, that's <laughs> what it is. But I, you know, I was a complete coward. Um, and I didn't come out to my boss till uh, it promoted me to the point where he couldn't get rid of me anyway. And then when I did come out, come out, he, um, he actually said he, he'd known years ago because I'd left something on the photocopier. Um, which <laughs> I <didn't> ask. <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, that's what, I'm not sure what surprised me. A, he knew where the photocopier was, or what I was. <laughs> or what, I'd love to know what I actually left on there. That's, that's the way to laugh. But I, I kind of feel a little bit guilty that I, I didn't come out to him earlier, um, because our relationship, you know, would have would have been stronger and uh, and closer uh, a lot sooner. And it certainly got or better as you do with my family when you come out uh suddenly you know you don't feel that you're living a lie anymore um uh, the whole ally thing i think is just so important not not only with straight allies but also networks working together and um where um sometimes networks tend to fight their own corner a little bit too much even though i think we're all like a venn diagram but somewhere in the middle there's a common ground that i think if we all focused on um we could uh we could take over the world uh, as it were um and it's not, you know uh, uh, not for the first time during um 
during the Stonewall riots, they actually um, they are, they had allies in the Black Panther movement because they were both being beaten up by the police at the time. They ended up working together, the, the Welsh miners and um, uh, and the Gay Liberation Front, and they they had the um, pits and perverts uh, concerts for the communards in the in the mid eighties. Uh, if you're um, old enough to remember those, but um, you know, there's a great history of, of groups working together. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I do think it's one of the areas where if you've experienced what it feels like to be marginalised or, or, or experience prejudice, it, it, it means, I hope, um, that we're more open or potentially more aware of what's going on around us, whether it's, you know, a, a woman who's not getting her voice heard or a, a trans person that is being treated like they're not a part of our community or, or whatever it is. So, I, you know, I, th I think it's a really important um, part of, of what helps to create that change. Um, Rebecca, I've, I've noticed you've popped on the screen, so I'm thinking you might have a question for us. <laughs> oh, you're on mute. Somebody had to do it, didn't they? <laughs> I'm so glad it was you. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> it's, it's not a, it's not a pop of, a pop of call unless you, somebody says, oh, you're on mute. Um, <laughs> I was just going to say, um, I, I, it's the ally piece is so important, and I, I think Tina, you're right. It's, it's about understanding that you haven't got the lived experience of somebody else, but you can be nice. And I mean, I remember 20 years ago when I first started working in construction and feeling quite fraudulent because I wasn't, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't have a trade or, or profession, and um, I was actually working humanitarian aid at the time. And I just accidentally ended up in, in construction. And um, I got my bottom pinched by um, this very senior man um, when I was having a conversation with an even more senior man. And it, it just, you know, little things like that just, I think, set the path of how you develop as a person and how you can um, yeah, find the strength and, and who can be there to support you. And, and yeah, for me, that was just a one off. Um, I, I am in the majority. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't have to contend with a lot of the other challenges that people in the minority do so um, I agree let's all just be nice thank you very much so on that note I'm going to read I've got a couple of comments um, one from Luke just referring back to Rainbow Laces are we doing enough um, and he's commented that BAM has included um, inclusive hoarding on sites often has LBGT, LGBT plus flags flying on sites there's a, there's a lot of alliteration and flags flying and letters there um, but as you say these examples are very far and very few between um, and Micah has also just flagged up the Register of Tradeswomen, which is launched today, open for registration, um, and it will provide tradeswomen, many of whom, many of whom are LGBTQ+, um, and they'll provide those, those women um, from early 2021. And then we have this, a question, and a great question because actually it's focusing on, on youth. So this is from Renee, um, and she says a general question, has anyone struggled to reach out to young LGBTQ+, LGBTQI plus individuals in the industry? Is there any sort of barrier or dynamic that changes with age? So that's a super question. And I yeah. will have to revert back to not being the chair. <laughs> <laughs> um, those, those are great questions. Yeah, sorry, David, go for it. Engaging with the youth is, um, is a real problem. Um, and um, it's just slightly ironic that we, we've had more support uh, as Freehold from the property press than we've, we've had from the gay press. And I, um, it's a real shame that uh, you know, the likes of uh, Boys and QX and Gay Times and uh, Attitude um, and Diva don't do a feature on, uh, on, on professions um, that might encourage um, some more LGBT young people to, uh, to, um, to go into the professions uh, and just make them appreciate that, you know, it, it is a well, or can be a welcoming environment um you know there's a well-known stat also about graduates going back into the closet when they uh, when they join their first employer and at freehold what we've tried to do is uh if uh, um if a graduate contacts us and say we're, we're we're i'm joining this company and we'll put them in contact with an existing freehold member within that company and it just makes that initial kind of coming out uh, conversation just so much easier if you've got uh, a friendly uh, I won't say arm, arm around you, because you're probably not allowed to do that anymore, certainly now, but, um, uh, but, but yeah, uh, it, it, it's real, real tough, just getting the you know, young people to understand property and construction at all. We, we, you know, we 
we still haven't cracked it. And I, look, I, uh, I wish I had a, a magic wand to resolve that. Mm. One of the things I really love about being co-chair of Planning Out is when people contact me and they say, um, oh, I'm, I'm going to get a job at Barclay, I'm going to get a job at a major house builder or on a construction site. You know, do you happen to know anyone at that company that's openly gay that you can put me in touch with? And um, on every occasion that someone's reached out to us, we have been able to do that. Um, you know, we have a look at our mailing list and we see people's email addresses and you know, which company they're, they're connected with. And we, we approach them and say, look, do you mind if we put you in touch with this person? They're about to join your organization and you know, they, they want to come out basically, but they don't know how to do that. And they don't know who's friendly and who's not. And um, it's worked really well. I'm really pleased with that. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. I think link, linking into that question or the, 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 was the, the other point around the, you know, the rainbow laces and the, and the flags, um, but I think this point about, you know, what what are the barriers, particularly in in perhaps on site or or in the sort of the 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 very kind of construction focused part of the construction industry, if that makes sense. What do you what do you think it is that that's going to create that change? How how do you think we can we what why is it not happening and, and what do you think we need to do to make that happen? It's a funny one, isn't it? Because like I said, as a woman on the construction site, I've, I'm already a minority. So for me coming out, I've always been openly gay. So that's never, ever been the issue. It's being a woman. So we just need, for me, more women on site. Yeah. And then yeah. I think coming out as a lesbian or bisexual or trans isn't going to be the biggest problem you're going to face. Yeah, yeah. But as a gay man, I think it's a bigger problem. Um, and I don't know how you're going to get around that one. I don't know. Do you think if there were more, because it's, it's that if there were more, if there were more women on site, that might, you know, and more diversity generally on site, then yeah. maybe it becomes a bit, uh, you know, generally you find in a more diverse environment, people are more open to different people. Yes, I totally but, agree with that. That if you've got yeah. all different types of people on site from different backgrounds, um, different educational backgrounds, people with disabilities, because they're an underrepresented group as well. Yeah. Um, so I think the more diversity you've got, then when you just throw in one more thing that you're on the gay plus spectrum, you know, it's not a big deal. But when it's white, male predominantly, then, yeah, you've only got to be slightly different and you just don't fit in. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, more so, diversity and inclusion, definitely. So I'm, I'm interested in how you broke that barrier down. I've, I've read on your website that your dad was a builder, but I, 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 you know, it must still have been quite a tough call 30 years ago to say, do you know what I'm going to do? You know, I'm going to yeah. do this. What, 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 what helped you to break down that barrier? And do you think there's any of that that we could kind of spread out to the wider community? Yes. Yeah, I just think be yourself, be open, be confident about who you are. So I literally moved to London when I was 27 with a baby. She was 15 months old, put some adverts in the gay paper, the pink paper back then, and the phone just rang off the hook. My housemates would take messages for me. I'd go and do the quotes, Karen Daisy, you know, and people loved having me do their jobs. And so over the years, I've learned all the other trades. Um, so I started off with just painting, decorating and carpentry. And I've literally learned pretty much all trades, apart from gas and major electrics. Um, and yeah, so I just think be yourself. If you're confident in who you are, people naturally are drawn to you. That's my experience. I've never had a problem being gay, doing the job that I do. Like I said, being a woman has been the biggest problem, but not from my customer's point of view. It's from breaking into that male dominated industry. That's been the hardest part. But I think the more I've done it, the stronger my backbones become. So I can just take, you know, whatever comes my way. And that's why now I just try to inspire other people just do it, just go for it, get stronger. Yeah. <laughs> Each new hurdle that comes your way will make you stronger. <laughs> yeah, I have to say, you look like you love it. I, I think I'd be rubbish at that job, but you're actually quite inspiring me to do it. <laughs> I do love it. I do every job I do with the same enthusiasm as though it's day one and it's been over 30 years. <laughs> Fantastic. We definitely need you on the posters. Um, <laughs> Chris, David, before we move on, I think Rebe Rebecca's got another question for us, but Chris, David, any, anything from your point of view on this one? What, what, what do we do to break down these barriers? I'm thinking of what people have said to me at various planning out events. I think it's having more young people and younger people um, on construction sites and in, in building and built environments. That's really the key to, to acceptance, it seems. Um, you know, people seem to be able to come out to younger people because it's a different mentality in many instances. 
Um, and I think that's quite interesting. I'm not quite sure why, why, but maybe because younger, younger gay people, you know, they've, they've got more role models on television or, you know, the culture has changed slightly and, or they've been to university and they've met lots of gay people there. Um, but that seems to be the key to kind of unlocking it for, for people who could, don't, who can't come out, um, mm -hmm. kind of connecting with those younger people on site and coming out that way. And that then gives them confidence and sets a kind of cultural norm on the building okay. site. Um, that being okay is okay because younger people find it okay. And if the older people don't, they look a bit like dinosaurs. Mm. Yeah, that's a good good point, actually. Very good point. Um, David, uh, any? It's any a conversation, if I'm honest, it's a conversation I avoid on site. There's enough reasons for people to hate me on site when I'm uh, condemning work <laughs> or doing evaluation. I don't want to add another, another reason for them to hate me. But you're right, I, I, I should do better. I, I will take this, I'll be inspired by Tina and go away and come out on all my building sites next week. <laughs> I, I think it's it's an interesting point actually around um, that, that that piece on, actually actually both, I mean, I, I get that there's a bit of a joke in there, but also, you know, frankly, sometimes it can be hard. And I, and I guess, you know, it's the, sometimes there is a pressure when you're out you know that you should be out all the time and you should be a role model all the time but actually mm. you know I think the more of us that are out and the more of us that are able to talk about it perhaps you know you don't have to come out every single time maybe you can just you know condemn the building and move on you know um so I think it's I, I think I think there is you know at, at a certain point in time when there's only two poster children in the industry I think that's a lot of pressure to put on people um but, but hopefully if we can widen that out, it stops being something that has to be talked about. And I think Chris, to your point around younger people, I think where the culture has changed and actually the, the law has changed. You know, I think you know, it was only what 2003 where it became, you know, we became a protected characteristic um, or thereabouts. Um, so, so I think, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. I think there has been a sea change and, and amongst younger people and younger LGBT people, I think they're not ready to, to they don't, they, they don't expect this to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so hopefully there's a, there's, there's hope in the next generation coming through and, uh, and, and educating all us older people about, about that. Um, now I've just outed myself as an older person, I'm going to quickly move over to Rebecca um, for, the, for the next exciting question. So you're going, you're going from older person to, to Rebecca there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take that on the chin. Um, I, I just had, so I've got a, I've got a couple of comments um, and the questions come in. Um, I, my phone has pinged with, this panel is awesome. Team oh. So um, I'm, I'm just loving, I'm loving this, this is fantastic. Will you tell my mum to stop commenting? It's not. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and uh, and no comments on the on the grey hair. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, oh, darling I'm, children. <laughs> um, right. I'm so um, I thought just um, relevant here. Um, Mike has just commented that greater diversity in the workforce increases inclusion and safety, um, and saying that she believes it will help with the appalling record for mental health our industry has. I think it is a really valid um, observation there. Mm -hmm. um, we have um, a second question, so just a please reminder to people we've got under 20 minutes left, so please do keep sending them in. And also do use the chat just to throw in what you would do, um, you know, what are your actions, what are your challenges, because we're capturing all of this to then feed back as, as the, you know, the plans for building people, how we move forwards, the actions for cultural change. So here we have one from, from Kelly saying that early in the, in the year, RICS said they didn't want to rush change because many of their members come from small companies. And I'd be interested to know if that's change in terms of just diversity and inclusion or if anybody knows more about that RICS, um, why they didn't want to rush change. So her question is, how can we encourage SMEs to become more inclusive? Who wants to take that one? David, you look like you're about to. Yeah, I, well, a couple of things. RICS, um, I mean, they, they, they have been very supportive and their intentions are, uh, are, are, are very admirable. Um, they have limited resources um, and, uh, and it's our subscriptions which are paying them so they, they, they are under some, some financial pressure and it's up to um, business to, to help them. They are just about to start a consultation to give them a quick plug on their new code of conduct um, so any surveyors um, on this call, please go to the RICS website and uh, get involved in that. But they are particularly that they're engaging with Freehold to get involved in uh, in drafting the new code of contact. 
being conduct with his grace and that's regardless of size of business that's down to the individual surveyor so that's really good um i mean tft we are an sme and we don't you know we have one hr person who's extremely busy um our marketing team love to get involved in inclusivity and um, diversity initiatives um and, and get volunteers internally within your organization to, to help out we we had a great campaign last week which didn't cost a penny uh, for inclusion week um which was every day everyone was set a task which was you know email someone you've you've never emailed before um thank someone for something they've that they, they've done reach out for someone who's 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 ethnically different to you or or gender different to you who's basically different to you ask them a question and that's that helped that really just helped um got quite a really good reaction and just stoked quite a lot of conversation internally whereas previously it's quite awkward asking someone about their you know their religion uh, if it's different to you um and uh, it worked really well so i you know if anyone's interested in, in in that i'll happily share um what, what we did and the slides we used for that 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 sounds great because i think sometimes and i know i've had questions on other events that i've been involved with from smes and people running smaller companies saying how you know it's all very well for the people at big companies but how do you do this without spending a lot of money or without resourcing so i think those sort of ideas um that that could be shared i think are really really valuable because i think a lot of people do want to, to make this change happen um but maybe don't have a dedicated dni person to do it um, i work for an sme as well and um you know there's less than fewer than 100 of us um and i just wrote to my chief executive and said like i'd really appreciate it if i could have one day of the month where i can spend doing planning out things and he was more than happy to do it because you know it's, it's great for the company and actually it's good for business it means that you know i, I meet lgbt clients people i'd never have met otherwise and um you know we've signed contracts together which has been fantastic um a really small thing i did was during pride i asked um hr to put a happy pride banner on everyone's email um you know just a really nice thing with the company logo and the, and the lgbt flag and the amount of people that emailed me back saying oh really nice to see your company celebrating pride um you know people had no idea were gay and had never heard of planning out a freehold and then i go back and tell them about it and they sign up um so it's amazing how the smallest things have the biggest impact mm -hmm. I think I think it does. I mean, I, 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 the company I work for, we our, our consumer facing arm, Strutt and Parker, has estate agents, and our Canterbury office um, <laughs> sponsored Canterbury Pride, and we we made the logo into a rainbow. We had some adverts and what have you, and the feedback was was overwhelmingly positive actually mm. from the client base. And I think you know my my takeaway from that was I think some people. Are really positive about it other people don't care you know it's very rare now I mean, you know maybe get the odd person who sort of say, says all oh, this is ridiculous but i think yeah. you know, generally it's a, it's a positive thing um for, for the brand and I, I think creates a good a good feeling with your client base so um yeah and again not not a hugely expensive thing to do to to, to put a little bit of money behind something like that mm. yeah um tina i guess your your size of business you're a, you're a kind of smaller SME, uh, any, any sort of thoughts or advice for people who are working in, in sort of small companies or working for a sole trader, or, or even perhaps for a sole trader who thinks, I don't want to come out because my clients might not like it? Yeah, see, I always just think, be yourself. Like I said, if you're confident in who you are, generally people like you. And if they don't, they weren't a nice person in the first place. And I'd rather people out themselves as to what type of person they are. And I'm always really, really open about my sexuality. Um, I'm a single mum. My daughter's mixed race. I've um, got a few mental health issues in the, in the background. So I'm really open about all of that. And it's amazing how much my customers open up to me. And by the time I finish their job, we're hugging each other. Bye. <laughs> you know, so I just think, be yourself, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, um, that's lovely. I still, I still think we need you on the poster for uh, for, for, for construction. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> sorry, Chris. You looked like you were going to say something. No, I was going to say that kind of positivity is, is so infectious, it, and it just, it's just lovely. Isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's so inspiring, and I think yeah. you know, even if you're the most negative anti, you know, LGBT person very hard to be negative when someone is so overtly positive yeah um you know it yeah. takes a real kind of hardened heart to yes 
to maintain that attitude, I think. Yeah, and the weird thing is, my partner, um, she's uh, mixed Turkish and Maltese, and her parents, obviously Maltese and Turkish, they don't like gay people at all. She was kicked out of the family for 10 years, but I've actually worked in their house and decorated their house. So they mm. absolutely love me because my work is so fabulous. I'm also a mother, so they love me because of that. And then I'm a lesbian. And that's just blown their mind because they're like, well, we don't like gay people, but they can't not like me. <laughs> so I've helped them change their attitude towards gay people. You know, it sounds like I think if you're positive about yourself, other people find it really hard to hold on to their negative stereotypes that they've had for like, probably, I don't know, God knows how many years, because you're dispelling all their myths. And it's fun, it's really fun watching people, that, the confusion, like we like you, but you're gay, but that's, <laughs> it's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, I mean, that, that goes right back to, to when Freehold started, really. We, we were very judgy of the of the industry, expecting to, to be given a really rough ride. And um, when I told my boss that I was starting Freehold Up, he said, you know, we fully support you, but, you know, don't expect the old guard to support you. Whatever the old guard is, I have no idea. But, um, but when we don't actually kind of com confront people, um, you know, we did. I, I we didn't get a single. Well, to my face, obviously, didn't get a single negative reaction. Everyone was like, "No, it's about time. The industry does need to change. What can we, what can we do to help you?" It was almost embarrassing uh, the, the the outpouring of offers of help that we got when we first started. And it was, if anything, it was our our our, our unconscious bias uh, which held us back from doing it doing it sooner. Yeah. Um, we, we're getting towards the, I think we, we're getting towards the end of our session. I think we've got sort of five or so minutes before wrap up. But there's, there's one question which I think um, Rebecca has been looking at across all sorts of aspects of diversity. And that was, if you were the boss of the built environment, what single action would you take to uh, deliver and enable change? And what would be your highest priority? So I'm guessing where this is like the, the built environment in its biggest sense. So you are solely responsible for the entirety of the built environment in the UK. Yeah, um, you are the, the you big are the, Lord boss head of, you are it. You are it in terms of the built environment. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big responsibility. So I'm, I'm giving a drum roll. So you've got a, a second to think about what you might want to say. Um, but um, anybody want to take that one on first? Oh, everyone's ah, David, go for it. Uh, I'd like to get my mum to understand what I do for a living. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but seriously, I, that kind of goes on to this this whole piece about people just not getting construction and and property and not not realizing what a what a great industry it is. And you, we have things, you know, there's apps like Sim City, which uh, kids spend days on creating um, cities. And you know, why not become a planner and join? And join planning out. Um, um, I think if we can just just um, make get that kind of message across that the industry is 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 not what you think it is. Is not the stereotype that you think it is, and it's got great people in it. And it's more, you know, it's a people industry. Uh, it's a bit of a cliche, I know, but it's you know, it's also fantastic if you're nosy. You get to poke around the most interesting places and where people <laughs> live, uh, live, sleep, work. Um, and play it's uh, it's fantastic I don't need to tell you that obviously if I'd if I'd have known the nosy element I'd have come into the industry much earlier um Chris you've got your speaker on have you, have you got a, a thought if you were the overall responsible person for the built environment I would I'd love people would say yes when we approach them for sponsorship for events um sadly so many people say no and I, I don't know why it is. I think it's because they haven't really understood, you know, the point of a gay networking event. They don't really get it. I think they think, why would you pay for drinks and nibbles and venue hire for this? Um, and I'd love to have the opportunity to explain to those decision makers that actually doing this is really good for your brand. It's really good for your employees. And it's really good for your business because you'll meet people who will come and work with you and for you that you would never otherwise have had contact with. Mm. Um, so I think, you know, if anyone's ever approached a sponsorship, um, it just, we're, we're never asked for a huge amounts of money. Um, always sign them off because it makes such a difference having a, and hopefully post COVID, we'll go back to those big networking events, um, you know, where you can get people in the room and people are having a drink together or even just having breakfast together early in the morning um, and meeting people that you'd ever, ne never otherwise meet. Mm. 
It feels like another world now, doesn't it? I'm, I look forward to those days. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, thanks, Chris and Tina. How about you? Yeah, yeah. If I could help um, make the industry look like it's more far more inclusive and diverse. Because right now it looks like it's white, male and young. But if there could be an outing day, like an out day, where we all out ourselves. So people can talk about whether they're gay, straight, on that spectrum, got any disabilities that are visible or non-visible, mental health issues, um, uh, like your ethnic background. Maybe you might appear to be like a white man, but you're married to a Muslim lady or a trans person. So just to show how much diversity there actually already is, but it looks like it's just white and male. Just so people think, well, if they've just come out with all of these things about themselves, maybe I'll come out with all the things about myself that aren't necessarily visible. To just show that we are actually quite diverse already. Yeah. To help, and that I think would help reduce the mental health issues within the construction industry. Um, yeah. It's a really good point. I know when, when I came out, um, I was surprised by the number of people who sort of came out to me, you know, colleagues who said, oh yeah, my sister's gay or my, you know, my so-and-so's gay. And I just thought, I really wish that I'd known that because, you know, it would have been fine to tell you this years ago, but actually, you know, and you're, so I, I love that idea. I think I think if we brought all this together, maybe what we need, we need to pitch an idea to a t, you know major TV network about some sort of drama set in the LGBT building kind of construction diverse community. So it's something like the kind of Ali McBeal of of the 21st century that's set in in the built environment. We need to have a, a national come out about yourself day on, on site. Um, and we need to host a whole load of uh, planning out and freehold events in order to uh, facilitate this network and maybe launch our TV show. There we go. I think we're, um, Rebecca, you give, give us a day running the built environment and I think we'll have it sorted for you. I think that's the most fabulous suggestion. I, I mean, Ali McBeal, I just remember being so envious of her suits. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> was probably in the days when I was wearing Doc Martens and had no interest in wearing suits. I've got, I've got a feeling I might be, I, I might again be alienating the, the younger end of the audience, but um, Google it, Ali McBeal, it was very good in the day. Yes, yes, and I'm sure they've got all that on Fortnite and that's something happening as well. Um, we have three minutes left. Um, I, I just wanted to quickly pick up on something that Tina said about, um, and I, I think it's a great idea about so this national out day of just this is what it's like. My, my, my challenge is that you know, I know that UK Construction Week has role models, I know the CITB has ambassadors, and it's doing our own thing. And so it is this my big plea is that please let's let's just do this together. You know, let's join the dots. And that is certainly the role that um, we try and play within building people. Um, I, I also just want to say, wow, this has been the most engaging, inspiring, invigorating. So it's, it's not just that Chris sits there with his jumper matching the background and I'm highly envious of that um it, it's you know it, tina your enthusiasm is wonderful and david i i, I love your perspective on everything and, and me so you've, you've shared this so so brilliantly so i'm just going to say thank you very much to all of this amazing panel uh, thank you to the audience 